one. Fire hazards detected. I loved Prey. The 2017's immersive combination of action and RPG is it another excellent product from Bethesda's Arkane Studios, who are behind the equally outstanding Dishonored series. At first, I didn't know what to expect from this game, because I didn't consume that much media about it, but afterwards its gorgeous, stylized graphics, complex survival mechanics and the intricate representation of people of color in a multi-directional, morally grey story captivated me. The questions posed by the narrative, the main character's motivations and often disturbing pasts and the grand scheme of things, buttressed by stellar game design, turned this belated purchase into one of my favorites. So when E3's Bethesda conference announced Prey Moon Crash, it had a rather vague description, a seemingly roguelike addition into the main game where your primary focus is to scavenge, avoid and escape. Aside from the short trailer, not much else was explained. But I bought it anyway, because as E3 has had its course, I just began my first playthrough of Prey. What I didn't expect, however, was a spin of the game's genre into an addictive, genial swirl that I'd like to showcase in this video. In Moon Crash, the labyrinth you'll explore is a small facility on the moon, consisting of laboratories, industrial workshops and accommodations for its workers. There are two timelines here, the past and the present. The latter is you, Peter, a Kazma sort of illegal hacker and operative whose main task is to restructure the destruction of Trenstar's moon base. Sequestered into a small, contained orbital device above the station, through a Tata operator, you'll exercise in simulations that bring light to Moon Crash's past. In it, the Typhon have spread across the facility and slaughtered pretty much everyone except for five characters, the engines of your simulations. At first, you begin with Andreas, a volunteer damaged by the terrible Trendstar experiments, but turned into a literal human psi machine. He's your introduction into the environment you'll try to survive in. Your first excursion is both curious and terrifying. You've no knowledge of the moon base. Silence has seemed to devour every corner, every corridor. Your boots, that crackle on the milky crust are a painful echo that might attract every Typhon against you. You only have one ability, poor health and zero equipment. After the initial area, you reach the crater, the heart of the Quadragon that is the moon base. It's huge, populated by few basic Typhon enemies. But their scarce numbers or weak powers don't relax you, they unnerve you because it feels like an obvious trap. And again, the silence. A vast glass ceiling above you, a strange construction right ahead of you, and walkways towards the separate facilities. You only have one goal, reach the escape pod behind the crater and flee. So you do. Brave players will take on some of the Typhon and notice the currency reward they'll get for each kill. And if they do a bit of exploration, they'll discover fabrication data that grants the same and supposedly a means of devising more tools for your missions. However, most players will just leg it due to the legitimately frightening atmosphere. In the Critters Escape pod, you'll encounter a new enemy, a corrupted harvester, a large plated machine that collects metallic resources strewn across the moon. Bullets don't stop it, wrenches don't bite through it. In this introductory case, you have to use your psi powers to destroy it. You notice a control module, fabrication materials, but they'll slip your mind because you just went through a tense, unexpected fight with an enemy not seen in the main game. And driven by that fear, you'll dive into the escape pod, never looking back. This, my friends, is the first 30 minutes of Boon Crash, a slight peek into the roguelike design and structure of this DLC, and it also pales in comparison to the build-up following after. Moon Crash is on a constant loop. Through a quiet quintet, you must complete objectives given to you by Kazma. These include the character's personal objectives and their means of escape, because there's always one escape pod in each simulation. As you advance through Moon Crash, you'll gain access to the shuttle, a loader propeller in the Moonworks, and even a mimic portal in the Pythias Labs. 
Before each loop, you have the chance to equip your selected character, just like in roguelikes such as Darkest Dungeon or Rogue Legacy. The items you can purchase, chips you can install, rely on your discovery of the fabrication plans that become a permanent resource when you pick them up. These range from the aforementioned chipsets to weapons, medical equipment and engineering devices. Your first several runs are what makes Mooncrash the tensest. You've the fewest characters, the littlest resources, and the least knowledge of the moon base. There's almost this desperate emotion, lodged in your head like a dagger, to forget about everything the location has to offer and bolt it for the nearest escape route. You're not Morgan Yu anymore, a crafty scientist who has such an arsenal at his disposal. You're small, weak, and blind. After you unlock the second character, Joan Winslow, you begin to understand, albeit slowly, the magnitude of Mooncrash. Joan is a stark difference to Andreas. More health, better suit, and unlike him, she can repair elevators, doors, and summon a ballistic turret against enemies. These differences are further distinguished by the available Neuromod upgrades, preferred equipment, and even UI stats. These will become much more important in later parts of the DLC. After the tense ordeal with Andreas, he'll pick up Joan to unlock more of Mooncrash, since she, naturally, seems like a more solid candidate to obtain the resources you'll need. And then, the game tricks you. The environment feels different the moment you step out of the ventilation shaft. There are Typhon enemies in the starting location. Before the crater's entrance, you get the Artax propeller system, and a weird audio log about a strange... and deadly presence in the DLC. You head out, see the hub in front of you, and the fucking moon shark says hello. Its first appearance can differ. You may feel an earthquake beneath your feet, followed by its barrage through the underground, and your ears shredded by its horrible shriek. Or you can see it in the distance hunched over, dribbling its weird animalistic sounds as it waits for your move. Taller than the nightmare from the main game, and with pale white crystals that protrude from its head and shoulders, the Moonshark heightens up the introductory hour's intensity to a whole new level. It has a giant health bar for your poorly equipped characters, resists damage because of its armor, and, whether by its kinetic boulder shower or its swift slices, can slaughter you with one accurate hit. You can try to kill it for sure, but expect a long, arduous fight, and if you're not a skilled prey player, you won't last for long. It has a fantastic detection of sonic reverberations, which means that just one step on the moon's surface attracts it. However, it's also blind, so sneaking around it, even at a close distance, isn't difficult. Moonshark isn't susceptible to a random roll. It's an ever-present foe on the crater after your first few runs. Whether you like it or not, you'll have to deal with it. Always. But how, when, where, and with whom, that's entirely up to you. Mooncrash's first phase drowns you in this intensity and fear. Your only solution is to grow bold, and by grow bold I mean to adapt, to analyze the array of options Arkane Studios have given you, and construct your steady, progressive pace through the moonbase. You have to explore. You have to acquire materials for better gear. You have to take a deep breath and pass that damn moonshark. And once you do, the DLC sinks you in, not letting you go for hours sometimes. You'll quickly notice how easy it is to gain the currents you need for the equipment presented in the simulation setup. Elimination of Typhon, the harder, the greater rewards, collection of fabrication plants and chipsets, the moon base's slow repair, completion of personal objectives and escape routes, these are your runs bread and butter. As you delve into the first ever facility, the Crew Annex, you'll stop worrying about how much credits you'll need for the next attempt because the rewards become ubiquitous. Your attention shifts towards the new environment and its secrets. Strike me down if those secrets aren't so tantalizingly designed. They hide behind damaged doors, hidden passageways between chambers, or are placed in clever locations that demand a bit of pathfinding from you. These crates, divided by color, which identifies their purpose, prolong your run and its quality. Soon, you'll find your first golden briefcases and crates, special loot containing chipsets, rare fabrication plants, and weapons. A well-prepared display case for the next unveiled mystery of Mooncrash. Weapons have... levels now? Chipsets too? Green? Blue? Maybe even orange, if you're extremely fortunate? 
These items, an exemplification of your growing bravery, push you further until your steadfast investigation upturns every stone available right now. Mooncrash also reveals its next surprising quality, the story. I almost expected Arkane Studios to just conjure up a roguelike simulation and that would be it. But no, quite the opposite happened here. The basis past is parceled out just like the gameplay. Glimpses, moments of aha, little hints that can be examined on a deeper scale the next time. Characters, both alive and dead, are full of detail. What they did before the tragic accident, their personalities, ambitions. What's better, it blends to the main plot and the secondary minutiae so excellently. It's an extraordinary mirror sheen of the main game. You'll most likely conclude your initial adventures by John Winslow's personal objective, a heartbreaking series of injustice, corporate scheming, and senseless loss. It's a spark that shines so bright in Mooncrash, and evokes the same heavy questions posed in Morgan Yu's timeline. As you get better all around, the game picks up a different pace, more rapid, confident, and excited pace. Your weapons, identical to the main game with one, two new additions, have a hierarchy now, driven by color. Gray is the weakest, while orange the strongest. For example, a gray range won't do much, like in Prey, but its orange counterpart can kill a Typhon by one swing. Joan, who specializes in range combat, can even take down telepaths and technopaths with two, three hits. This is yet another cork in the machine of Mooncrash's combat, because each level has distinct strengths and advantages. Orange shotguns do the most damage, but have a mediocre reload speed. Blue shotguns are a gunslinger's dream, but need to screech out more shells to kill a Typhon. As such, weapons aren't tied exclusively to a particular character, but can be used by all. You just have to select the proper character for a proper run. Chips are the same although they're more tied to simulation characters than the weapons. Same tier system, but a much wider variation of advantages. Greater speed, endurance, health, more psi energy. You can kit yourself out in numerous ways. And as the difficulty rises, you'll have to pay more attention to the details too. By now, you've unlocked a good portion of the moon base. You've seen several facilities and glimpsed even more of what actually happened here. Each branch, Moonworks, Pythias Labs, the previous crew and X, has distinct architecture and atmosphere to it. Different people are positioned in these locales, and you won't find heavy industrial equipment in a sophisticated, delicately cleaned lab. You won't see blueprints or mine out minerals in the crew and X either. There's this great, thoughtful balance and realism to Mooncrash's environment. It makes sense, it belongs there, it has its uses, and you never question it. With greater freedom and more powerful weapons comes a much more difficult challenge. There's a corruption level now, a bar on the upper right corner of your screen that monitors the severity of Typhon activities on the moon. Each new level births forth new Typhon and more environmental hazards. As you complete objectives, some of these levels rise up a lot quicker than before. Environmental hazards will be a new surprise against you. Based on RNG, each facility, even the crater, might be impeded by further obstructions. The crew annex can have unbearable radiation levels, which will require you to collect a lot of anti-rad or move around more carefully. Moonworks can be based in a firestorm, where your glue cannon will become the handiest tool in your arsenal. The crater has one particular hazard, a dust storm, which obfuscates vision for everyone in it. These force you to think even deeper about your inventory and its expenses. They affect your character objectives, escape routes, pretty much everything. They're not fatal, unless you're prone to clumsiness, but slow you down considerably. Your progress will widen the differences between playable characters, to the point where you'll discover another very clever design choice here. The labyrinth provides you numerous means of escape, but also of completion. This depends on how you'd like to play Mooncrash. Min Maxis will adore Joan Winslow, because she can collect most of the loot as the first chosen character, repair all the elevators and doors, and store the harvested resources at a secured area for the next characters. That's another brilliant option you can use. The simulation remains the same until you spend all of your characters in it. So, if you put your ransacked items right in front of the ventilation shaft for the next survivors, they'll be there still, which significantly neutralizes additional spending for your inventory. Inventory. Or, if you're not a min-maxer, Mooncrash provides you other means to entertain yourself. Say hello to Riley Yu and Vijay Bhatia, the two new additions. 
The former is actually a cousin of Alex and Morgan Yu, as well as head scientist and director of the Moonbase. She is the jack of all trades, using both psi and engineering skills to operate in the facility. You can clone Typhon, scan them, and blast them with kinetic energy. Riley is difficult to use because she uses two peak skill trees, which require more micromanagement and a strategic sense in enemy encounters. Riley is also the more interesting character for two reasons, positive and negative. The positive is in her escape route, the most holy shit unexpected departures from the moon base. Contacted by Alex Yu through her computer, she basically needs to clone her consciousness into a data operator. By doing so, if she doesn't survive her ordeal, that operator can be used to reenact her thoughts, memories and work experience. However, as you're strapped on, and the machine clones you, this happens. This will ensure at least something is left of our family. No one else is equipped to deal with what's coming. I'm putting Talos One in the dark after this. You won't be able to reach me. Hopefully, we'll see each other Earthside. Goodbye, cousin. Personality capture and emulation. Source, Riley Yu, Pythias Facility Director. Target, Minerva 465, Data Vault Class Operator. Capture and transfer complete. Additional instructions found. Starting procedure, erase you dot bat. Destroying source subject. Fucking hell. Unfortunately, her personal objective is the weakest. It's not just the easiest to do, but the least significant of them all. It does open up a conversation about the future of praise technology, but a small one, and outside of that, it offers a little. Also, other personal objectives give so much depth to your simulation choices, but Riley's story is more expressed in storylines that are about her, but not hers, if you understand what I'm saying. I must admit, Mooncrash focuses more on the employees of Transtar and not on the corporate leadership this time. Those who love the FPS element of Prey above all else will adore Bhatia. This Indian war veteran, now head of security on the moon, is a monster with weapons. His skills calibrate any gun in his hands into virtual cannons, especially the Q-beams and the shotguns. He's the definite choice to pick if you want to turn the Moonshark into mincemeat very quickly. Batia will also open you to the endgame, the narrative culmination of this DLC. This is yet another awesome moment, because his personal objective's resolution, its insinuations and consequences, are the last hints you need in order to understand Mooncrash's story in its completeness. There's such an incredible disparity between the beginning and the end of Mooncrash. Fear is replaced with excitement, as you now know the Moonbase's entire layout have access to the strongest weapons and all characters. Where the Moonshark was once a terrifying opponent who gave you no chance, now you can purchase an elite Q-beam from your inventory screen and explode him in less than a minute. Roguelikes mostly operate with just the fear and intensity, but also maintain a rather consistent level of pace as well. You get stronger, but the enemies get stronger. You can survive for longer, but the dungeons become longer too. You've more tools at your disposal, but at the same time, more mechanics are thrown at you. Mooncrash, after hours of hard work, diligent resource collection, and avid exploration, rewards you with an addictive emotion of power. Now, you can't be tricked, because you've been in every nook and cranny. Each character has become a serious threat to all Typhon. Hell, you'll grow stronger and better than Morgan Yu himself because of the Quintet's different skills. Now that the Neuromod upgrades allow you to focus on their concentrated strengths, you get the experience of peak level efficiency in each skill tree. Batia is basically Doomslayer Prey version with 380 health and combat proficiencies that allow you to take down even entire groups of Typhon. 
Joan Winslow gets so good with the wrench, she doesn't even need other weapons in her runs. Andreas is a psi cannon that can conjure up flame cones, energy blasts, and sturdy shields that can resist even a nightmare and moonshark slices both. Mooncrash is a roguelike that allows you to conquer it, tower over it, and shred the challenges. That's what makes it unique from other roguelikes, and it works. It's a risky spin on the most important design piece, the pace, because it could turn the DLC into a bore, a massive chore, or just a mad dash towards the best score. Arkane Studios have avoided that through all the layers I've already described. It's a roguelike merged with a sandbox, a combination that I'm surprised hasn't been done more, and should be done more. Even on paper, not only does it sound like a new, interesting evolution of the genre, but also as a potential, successful compromise of more than one game type, which could attract fanbases from both camps. Besides, the old roguelikes won't just disappear, particularly in these times, where their popularity has soared. So, Mooncrash could be the goldmine of new, bold ideas. The endgame provides two last items that were some of the biggest highlights for me. The first is the delay loop time, a strange pink hourglass that reverses corruption levels in your run. You can find it scattered across the moon base or collect it from dead powerful Typhon such as the Nightmare, Moonshark, Weavers, Technopaths or Telepaths. And just when you'll start thinking delay loop time is a collectible turned into a useful situational tool, you find its fucking fabrication plan. Yes, Mooncrash allows you to fabricate as many delay loop times as you wish, and they cost just about 2,500 credits, while Neuromods cost 4,000. If you have a stockpiled 100,000 credits or more, you can fabricate so many of these damned things, the corruption level will never scale above one. This is where Arkane Studios shot through the roof with the opportunities given to you. At first, I did think it was overpowered. I mean, constructing literal mini time machines sounds like that, right? But as the difficulty rises and the corruption quickens over time, you'll be surprised at how many times you activate delay loop times to avert more Typhon spawned at your location. For your run's first character, you spend close to 10 delay loop times before you manage to escape. And then there's Claire Witten. Claire Witten is the best narrative surprise of Mooncrash. On your selection screen, she's cloaked in thick shadows that obscure most of her appearance. She wears a janitor's uniform and almost passively swipes the floor with not a shred of attention aimed at you. The description even says that no one talks to her and that she is almost a ghost in the facility, wandering from hall to hall, corridor to corridor. Then, you complete Batia's story arc. If you're sharp, you'll instantly recognize Claire Witten's name in his personal objective, and after you complete it, she becomes the last unlockable character to flee with. Claire Witten, from a quiet, non-intrusive janitor, turns into a badass Australian Chasma spy. Like you. She wields a powerful Psy Cutter, basically a praised version of a sci-fi laser sword, and is garbed in a neat black and red uniform. She's the only hacker of the five, moves the quickest and the quietest. The best part about her, though, is her story. Claire Witten was the unknown, unsuspected answer behind many of the major incidents, crises and tragedies of not just Mooncrash, but the main game too. Death of Riley Yu? Her deed, by installing a master key into the data operator. The slaughter of security operatives to escape and thus facilitate Typhon corruption? Also hers. The political and economical paralyzation of Shanstar, which led to Prey's main plot? That's her work right there. Through her personal objective, you'll observe how just one agent, one woman, conjured up such a sleuth of problems, it brought about unbelievable damage to personal and property. Even under your control, she becomes terrifying due to the consequences of her actions. She's also a magnate's nightmare. Think about it, you own a gigantic business, rifled with terrible practices and a moral code, and all you have built, all you've carefully calculated for the best possible result, is brought down by... a janitor. A janitor who can slice you into pieces... in several seconds. 
Claire Witten is my favourite of the five, for all these reasons. And yet, she isn't the one you end Mooncrash with. Papa? Papa? It's me. Alexei. We can be together again. But you have to do what I say. It's very important. Okay, Papa? There's something... Something you have to do for me. For us. So we can be together. It's what you want. You have to find my toy. You missed my birthday. Miss so many. I think about you and my toy all the time. Remember, it's what you want. Find my toy. That monumental role rests in Andreas' hands. Poor, poor Andreas. A volunteer tortured by Transtar and, without his consent, transformed into an intense link between him and the Typhon. What you saw here was the beginning of his personal objective. You're not really yourself in this arc. You're under a direct control of a telepath, a fearsome prospect as you can see what telepaths do to their victims. When you touch the memory link for Andreas' tale, the corruption meter rises up up to level 4 instantly. In a sudden swift motion, the entire facility is infested with enemies and friends. Heavy, armored security operators scour the environment and can laser you to death in mere moments. At the same time though, you experience this wondrous, creepy setting too. All the Typhon don't attack you. In fact, they defend you if you're pursued by security operators. Weavers summon Typhon. Technopaths control turrets to bring them down. Moonsharks dart from the underground to battle at your side. It's so... weird. You've slaughtered Typhon for so long, and now, in Andreas, they see one of their own. It's one of the most surreal experiences in the entire Prey product. You almost want to stand around and watch the Typhon behave, react to things, since you haven't had that much of an opportunity to do it previously. It's difficult to predict what the telepath wants from you, since it has such a vague, innocuous task for you. Obtain a toy for your son, Alexei, which the telepath reenacts, and put it into a spaceship. Which then turns out to be an escape pod. And the toy is a mimic. So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you, Papa. Oh boy. Oh. Oh boy. The implications. And then your head explodes, a fate every mind-controlled human faces if they're not rescued by you through a psi ability. This was such an oh no moment in the story. Remember, in the true ending of the main game, Alex Yu shows you, on a massive array of computer screens, how the Typhon have swarmed over Earth after the Talos 1 incident. And aside from the revelation that you have been one of the Typhon all along, one question never got answered in this segment. How? How did it happen? How did the Typhon get on planet Earth? Andreas and his arc show us that moment. A tormented Eastern European technician turned into a vessel of doom for Earth, now headless in an escape pod that darts towards our home with a mimic, ready to infect the nearest technology, or human, once it hits the surface. This is an excellent combination of Prey's narrative style and the impact it tried to reach. It achieved both, a perfect follow-up in Mooncrash. The team who wrote this DLC story deserve a goddamn commendation for preserving its consistency. Outside of the impact, it adds more damning questions about Prey's lore and history. In the main game, we've already pondered the horrific practices of Transtar upon the volunteers, but also on the employees themselves, if they express insubordination. Our sense of righteous ethics and morality clashed with the incredible scientific discoveries humanity maximized 
to their fullest potential. The game toyed with our beliefs by these insidious temptations, which is why I began to love Prey so much. I adore games that test my integrity this way. Andreas is the individual effigy of this moral conflict. The message isn't spoon-fed, nor does it feel enforced on the narrative. At the same time, it isn't too vague or ambiguous about its point. All you must do is think a little and feel your blood run cold at the realization. Another major question from the main game is answered in Mooncrash. The entire DLC is concluded by Peter, the Casma operative, in the present. After you've completed every objective in your simulations, Casma leadership staff finishes your contract with your death by asphyxiation in the little orbital station you squatted in. That's one of the endings though. The other one, if you paid enough attention and were crafty, is met by a removal of the master key inside the data operator. The same one that <clears throat> terminated Riley Yu and installing an extra oxygen supply into your emergency compartment. Then you have to decommission the orbital station, as in deactivate its anti-gravity mechanisms and let it plunge onto the moon. The question is obvious, how far should corporations be let to accomplish their fiscal goals? When do we trust them to look away and when a union or a government has to intervene to protect the individuals inside and outside the corporation? Prey's main game showed us how Trendstar treated all kinds of classes in its Talos 1 base. Mooncrash looks at this question from another perspective. The corporate warfare between firms to obtain an economical hegemony. Claire Witten has slain numerous security officers, a director and brought down an entire facility to gather sensitive information. Kasma employs an entire army of these people, Peter included, who deal with blackmail, manipulating simulations and public defamation of its rivals. And then you have Trendstar's aforementioned practices on their own. It's a poignant, visible critique of hypercapitalist, uncontrolled corporatism. Prey shows us the darkest, most damnable side of this economical and political ideology. Lack of compassion towards humanity, a ruthless drive for profit, and hegemonizing almost every aspect of a capitalistic life where everything else suffocates under its oppressive grasp. What makes it so effective in Prey and its DLC is not the observation of the overall damage in one time period, but the damage done upon and by a vibrant cast of individuals. Thus, it has a more personal, impactful effect on players who are interested in the story. It takes skill and courage to answer the largest question of a game in its DLC, and a DLC whose experimentation has taken on a primary role. You have to give it to Arkane Studios here. Their formula of narration and character development have only improved since their Dishonored games. So, with Mooncrash, we have a two-shaded gem. A successful roguelike with an adulteration of the classic formula, which then becomes a high-quality, immersive and multi-layered edition. The latter shade is its story, a strong, confident continuation of its philosophy and core narrative, a DLC bold enough to explore the most uncomfortable themes and answer them with a diligent, thoughtful arc. Personally, Mooncrash had a greater impact on me than the main game, for several reasons. It's easy for me to put trust in an Arkane Studios product because after I've played their two Dishonored games, I just know I'm going to play a good game. So while Vanilla Prey surprised me quite a bit in its story, I had this instinctual feeling of expectation lodged inside of me. I knew the story will be good, and I knew it's going to spin a very effective, powerful twists that will leave me thinking about the main point of it all. But Mooncrash surpassed that, because it's rare to see a small to medium sized DLC have an all round superb quality. Hell, if we just look at the mechanics of Mooncrash, they didn't even have to bother with its story. I don't think that many people would complain about a lack of narrative as long as the roguelike elements would turn out as great as they did here. Secondly, I just had more fun in Mooncrash. I'm a min-maxer by nature, and in the main game I couldn't exercise this preference that much. I couldn't peak level certain skill trees because that would leave me severely underpowered for everything else. I couldn't gather all the resources and create a cannon of an inventory and weaponry because, especially on high difficulties, there just isn't enough of material to work with. Mooncrash, at last, allows me to do that. It allows me to choose which character suits my min-maxing needs and kit them out the best. And as a bonus, it turns the environment into a playground I can morph in whatever I want. In essence, Mooncrash is a great cocktail for someone like me. It has all the qualities I wanted it to have and more I didn't expect. 
For anyone who loves roguelikes or just the Prey game, I would wholeheartedly recommend this DLC. It's a wonderful dive into untested waters by Arcane Studios. I don't know if they'll produce other DLCs for Prey, or if they'll just cultivate Mooncrash for a while before the next future update. Whatever the case, I'm definitely going to be interested in what's to come. After all, the future's bright for Prey.